Hello and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is episode 194, A Round Peg Voice in a Square Hole Choir, with Timothy Mount. Tim's article, How to Ruin an Alto, was published in 1982-83 to in the Choral Journal and in MENC's publication. It included some strong language, like, there are no good reasons for allowing women to sing tenor, and others, which we will discuss in this episode. Timothy Mount, a professor emeritus at Stony Brook University, joins me to discuss his very strongly worded article from the early 1980s, and in what ways he still agrees and disagrees with himself 40 years ago. We discuss the thorny issue of balancing the choir's needs for balance and timbre preferences against the vocal needs of the individual singer. One of the claims in Tim's article was, forcing the female chest voice upwards is dangerous. In this episode, we discuss this belief and whether or not it is out of date in 2024. We also discuss the ways gendered language attached to voice parts and the norms related to these terms has changed since the article was published. Recently, Tim tried to repost this article on the ACDA Facebook page in an attempt to try to discuss some of these changes of perspective, but it was taken down. I personally disagreed with a good number of things in Tim's article, but I give him credit for being willing to discuss publicly how his views on a variety of these topics has changed over the course of his career. We can only move forward and grow when we can be intellectually flexible. So tune in and have your thinking stimulated and challenged. I'm sure you'll have thoughts and reactions to this episode. And then be sure to weigh in yourself on Facebook in the Coralosophers Facebook group or over on the Coralosophy.substack.com, otherwise known as the Coralosophy community. Contra IKC is putting together its Summer Institute for June 24th to 30th. You could, as a teacher, bring kids to Kansas City and spend a week singing with our amazing clinicians. We have Dr. Marcus Garrett from North Texas. We have Dr. Carrie Adams from University of Missouri. And we have Sophia Miller, the Young People's Chorus of New York City. So it's going to be an amazing event for kids grade four all the way up to adult. And then when you bring your kids here, you could also sing in the adult semi-professional ensemble. It's a really cool thing. So head over to ContraIKC.com for information. You can also find a link in the show notes. Ludus, the platform trusted by thousands of organizers to power their event ticketing, marketing, and fundraising, has just upped its game with an incredible new feature, volunteer management. Now you can streamline your volunteer coordination like never before. Volunteers can easily sign up for opportunities and shifts online while you effortlessly approve signups, track hours, and manage your volunteer team. Say goodbye to volunteer management headaches and hello to seamless coordination with Ludus. Try it at ludus.com forward slash Coralosophy and revolutionize your events. Patreon members really keep this show going financially every month, making sure all the costs are covered out of pocket. But they also get access to my Google folder of goodies, the private podcast feed. They find out who's coming on the show ahead of time and a variety of other fun little conversations that we're able to have over on the Patreon page. The producers and inner circle at Patreon are Brannigan Lawrence, Brian Long, Chandler Smith, Venture Studios, Jonah Clicksbull, Angie Schilling, David Kowalsik, DF, Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Heron, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kikachik. All right, everybody, I'm here with Tim Mount, and we're going to be discussing some of the challenges that choral directors and voice teachers have when singers sometimes need to be kind of placed like round pegs and square holes. What happens when we put people on voice parts that don't really fit their instrument? In particular, we might center on the idea of altos singing tenor, uh, some of the types of challenges that that creates. So Tim, welcome. I'm uh, excited to hash this out. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be on the program. I enjoy your program because sometimes it's a little edgy and a little (laughs) controversial, and I like that a lot. Uh, and I, I've been conducting for almost 60 years now, and this is very exciting. Well, good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad that you're here. Um, it, and it's interesting because when you say um, sometimes this program can be edgy or controversial, I agree with that uh, in the sense that if we don't, and this is just my opinion, but if we as academics and scholars and pr- uh, practitioners of a uh, of any field really uh, don't at least flirt with the edge, then we'll never know our potential. As a as an ecosystem, and that and that's kind of the the background behind this. I agree one hundred percent, absolutely. That's how you move forward and learn and uh, change and 
keep up to date. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, and that's actually a great uh, segue into what we're going to be talking about in a little bit. Uh, in that, you, I've got an article here in front of me that you wrote in 1982 or 1983 ish about some of these things and talking about like uh, adjusting and changing and thinking about things differently over the course of time. I know I've changed my opinions many times over the, not, I, I don't have quite 60 years experience, but I've got a couple decades of experience. And I know that even in that 20 years that I've been doing it, I've changed a lot about what I think and believe that is true about, uh, about voices, about people, you know, a lot of things. So this will be a good opportunity for us to explore those things. Now, before we do that, though, uh, tell us a little bit more about you. So you've, you, you did mention you've been conducting for 60 years, but how would you describe kind of in, a, in bullet points uh, for people who don't know who you are, what, is, what has been your path through choral music and vocal music? Well, one of the reasons it's been so long is uh, my high school choir director let me conduct uh, our magical group. And uh, this is Princeton High School, which had a, it still has a stellar program. And that got me started and loving, loving it. Uh, I got my doctorate from USC. I'm professor emeritus at Stony Brook University. Uh, my major instrument throughout my career has been voice. And I did a lot of professional choral singing. Uh, Stony Brook is located on Long Island, not far from New York. And so uh, back in the day, I would say I probably sang with every professional choir in New York or professional choir director. And before that, also in Toronto and Los Angeles and Detroit. Then uh, when I retired, I moved up to the Northern Adirondacks in New York State, upstate New York, and uh, rediscovered piano. And I had never played piano chamber music in my life. And I stopped taking lessons my second year in college. And so I started doing this and have found great joy in that. Hmm. Then la last year, I uh, conducted the Crane Chorus at the State University of New York at Potsdam, which is a large, excellent choir. Uh, we did Beethoven's Mass in C. And I had a blast doing that and uh, would like to do some more conducting again. That's great. That's a, that's a good summary. Um, okay, so let's let's jump into the the meat of this. Uh, I've got an article in front of me here from uh, I think it was an MENC publication back in 1982 and I think it's a good place to jump in because the article is called How to Ruin an Alto. And there's a, there's a quote that I found in there uh, that is pretty straightforward, and it says, There are no good reasons for allowing women to sing tenor. Do you still believe that that's true, uh, or would you say it differently now? And let's kind of jump into some of those, uh, like those nuances a little bit. Yeah, I, I was a little younger then, <laughs> and maybe a little, a little more impetuous than I am now, and I would probably qualify that especially given my experience in aging and with my own voice. Yeah. As most of the time with singers, they start losing their high notes when they get old. Um, and I even found I lost low notes, which was kind of my bread and butter because I was sort of a bass baritone with low notes. And so um, I started being a little bit more understanding, I think, of those altos who can't hack the alto part anymore range wise and um are happy to sing tenor uh this mostly takes place i believe in community choruses and um that's great you know keep people singing yeah. and uh we all know um i started thinking about this whole you know this article from 40 years ago i started thinking about it because I keep seeing these pictures and and going to concerts of community choruses where there are twice as many uh, sopranos and altos than there are tenors and basses. And I said, okay, I know it's been that way a long while. Um, you know, this doesn't happen at great music schools, um, but in community choruses, it's definitely uh, de rigueur, it seems to me. So I posted something on Facebook it was the, um, the choral music site. And I didn't realize it, but I believe that is mostly based in the United Kingdom. 
And I got a lot of interesting comments because I said, you know, why the dearth of tenors and basses in our choirs? I mean, why has this happened? And they said, well, actually, in the UK, sometimes it's the other way around. And I, I believe that has a lot to do with their traditions, with the uh, the boy choirs and the, the cathedral choirs and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, so I started thinking more about um, this issue of alto singing tenor. And it reminded me of this article I wrote 40 years ago. And so I published that on the same website. And they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't print. They wouldn't put it up. I, I didn't know why. Never heard why. Uh, I thought, well, maybe it has something to do with copyright, because, as you said, it was public in what it published in what was known as the Music Educators Journal back then. I don't know what it's called now. Um, so, because I, it was published again. It was reprinted in the Choral Journal. So I tried that, and I think I put it maybe on the ACDA Facebook page. Yep. Because if anybody's going to complain about copyright, you know, it would be the Coral Journal. And so, but they didn't publish it either. I think, as I mentioned, I think it was just a little too edgy. Yeah. A little too controversial. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because I, you know, I've, I've read through the article and I, I understand now why people would see it as controversial and as you mentioned you know your um you, your approach was to think about how your perspective about this has changed over time but it did seem like because i did see that post and i it, it blew up on you and that of course has happened to many people in a variety of groups um it, and it's and it's almost as if there is a problem in the ecosystem right now where because we primarily have these conversations on social media. Uh, we're not able to approach it in a, in kind of a dispassionate scholarly way where we could talk about how, how could a person believe something like this 40 years ago, but have their perspective change on it. So uh, if, for example, if we go back to that quote where it says there are no good reasons for allowing women to sing tenor, I believed something very similar to that when my career was starting because I also had not just, I just hadn't experienced the good reasons directly. Uh, and nobody had talked to me about it. So, for example, I had not yet directed a church choir with 75-year-old um, former sopranos and altos who who just would really like to still be singing, but their range is dramatically limited. Um, and if would I take that quote and would I apply it to them? Of course not. Uh, because, I, like you said, keep people singing if they if there's a place that they can sing. So the way I would now alter that statement is I would say... Um, there can be good reasons for allowing women to sing tenor, but there also can be bad ones. And I still think that that is, that is true. So there are some points in your, in your article that bring up certain bad reasons, I would say, uh, to put a, uh, a female voice uh, on tenor. And if, for example, if it is simply because, and this is directly from your article, I don't have enough tenors. So I'm going to put that round peg in a square hole, and I'm going to tell that, that female... Um, that she's going to have to sing tenor because the choir needs you to sing tenor. Now, it could be that that voice is totally healthily functioning on that tenor part, but it also could be not healthily functioning, and I think it's our responsibility as the director to not ask singers to do things that are unhealthy for them. Uh, how do you feel about that kind of adjustment to your original statement from the 80s? I think that's right on. It, that's exactly how I feel now. And that's why I brought that up. Yeah. Um, but let me mention uh, what inspired this article in the first place. Mm -hmm. I was just starting out my college teaching career, first at Oregon, uh, Eastern Oregon State University, and then at Southeastern Louisiana University. And I was teaching uh, quite a few voice students for the first time. And I hadn't taught voice before. As I mentioned, I had just gotten my doctorate and I was starting out. And that was part of the job. And I was upset by a number of the students I had who had sung mostly tenor. And it was damaging their range and their voice. They were carrying their chest up too high. 
um, and their head voice was, you know, it kind of sounded like um, listening to the old Joni Mitchell. <laughs> I don't know what she sounds like nowadays. I know she's still singing. Yeah. But that break in her voice was, you know, is quite pronounced. And it was it was not healthy for these young singers. So once again, I think like you, I've grown a little wiser in my old age and I would qualify my comments to say, you know, maybe college age singers, because that's that's the clientele I have the most experience with. Right. I can't talk about changing voices. I don't know about those. I never conducted a high, you know, except for honor choirs, I never conducted a high school choir or younger. So I, I would qualify that statement because that's what was upsetting me. Yeah. And that's why I think I, I put it so strongly. Yeah. Um, the, the reap. Oh, go ahead. The, the, I like the first, the title in the Music Educators Journal, How to Ruin an Alto. I, I think that was kind of catchy. But the <laughs> reprint in the, the, in the Choral Journal, Choral Journal was Female Tenors, a Deplorable Practice. That's pretty strong, pretty strong as well. But I would back off a little now. Choralosophy listeners will remember RyanMain.com, but he has recently created EndeavorMusicPublishing.com, which is something different, something bigger, and something better. Endeavor is not a marketplace. It's a traditional publisher with a 21st century business model, which means that they have editing. Each piece is chosen and selected with accessibility in mind. Endeavor supports composers with a majority of the sales going right to the composer. Plus, there are tons of voicings to fit the needs of your program, instant downloads, full recordings, practice materials, and more. So head over to EndeavorMusicPublishing.com now and check out the catalog. I am really excited to announce, after many requests, there is now a Choralosophy merch store. All you need to do is go to the website Choralosophy.com, look for the shop button in the top. You can find Literacy is Equity shirts and sweatshirts and signs for your room. You can find the Thank You for Your Mistake signs, which I love to put on the wall of a classroom, as well as a variety of other show designs and you can sport your Choralosopher status by going to Choralosophy.com forward slash shop and checking out the store there. Yes. Yeah, and of course, I think that's why those posts got taken down. Uh, it, it, most yeah. people in the, in the modern 21st century context of reading things on the internet, uh, everything is a, almost all decisions that people make based on what content they will engage with is the title. It's the title, yes. it, they, it, and, and once the title offends them, the entire article will be offensive. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, social media is, of course, new to me, mm -hmm. relatively new to me. Um, and I think you're absolutely right, because I do, you know, I read a lot. I read a lot of newspapers. I look at the title, and uh, I either move on or I read the article. Right. Yeah. And of course, like in, in our emails preparing for this episode, I, I mentioned to you that um, that I disagree with a bunch of stuff that you said in your article. Um, but what we're also when you get, go past the title, when you go past the clickbait, we're discovering that you also disagree with yourself 40 years ago in certain ways. And there are probably things in that article that you would say. And I, as I read it, I say, well, OK, that's a valid point And we should talk about that. But if we limit ourselves to that gut reaction, that limbic system kind of reaction to a, a, a title we see on the internet, then it doesn't allow us to look into the things that are, are important to discuss. So for example, um, you mentioned the, the issue of women carrying their chest voice too high. Uh, I was raised to believe, this is just another example of how my opinion has changed, I was raised to believe that there is no healthy way for that to occur. And that women who carry their chest voice too high will indeed damage their voice. I now don't believe that. And you're, you're welcome to kind of push back. Uh, but what I would say, and there's reason this is an important point to still raise in a choral context, is I would say it is very difficult, not impossible, it is very difficult to teach a, a, a female voice to do that in a healthy way in a choral setting. Because you can't really hear yourself. Uh, to me, like when you teach a, a, a woman to belt, for example, and it, like let's say it's a musical theater context or a uh, kind of a pop um, pop context, I think a really good voice teacher in a one-on-one -on -one setting could help someone learn to do that in a very healthy way, including teaching people not to do it too much, 
uh, to, to listen to their body when they're feeling tension or feeling swelling of any kind and to rest, uh, learning kind of laryngeal tilt ideas and various things. But when you're in a choir, uh, asking a whole section of females to try to do that all at the same time and then hoping they're all going to do it in a healthy way, um, that does become problematic. And so I wonder if uh, how you feel about that distinction between the one-on-one -on -one setting for belting versus in a choir where, hey, these, t these five women are going to go sing tenor. Yeah, well, that's a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. And um, I appreciate those comments. Um, absolutely. Belting is a mystery to me. And I know that People can sing that way their entire lives. They have successful careers and they sound great. You know, it's mm -hmm. exciting. It can just really say, wow, this person really cares about what they're singing. They're putting their heart into it and they can do it apparently without damaging their voices. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I don't know what their high G might sound like, you know, Right. If they had to. So they may have, I don't know. I'm not an expert on belting at all. I, I know very little about it, but they may have sacrificed that upper range. I imagine they have. And I think to me that depends. So for me, it doesn't, it depends on what the goal of the singer is. In other words, some people might say, I don't care about my high G. And in which yeah, case, right. in which case I say more power to you, but I Go do, but I do make that distinction of us, of our role as choral directors. Uh, like I think of my role as if like, if I teach someone private voice, my role and care for their voice is very different than what I have to th consider and think about when I've got 60 adolescents, for example, I teach high school kids. So if I've yeah. got 60 teenagers in front of me, I am going to think, I am going to think in terms of, I don't want any of these kids in my care for this hour at hour a day to lose their high G someday because they don't even they don't even know what their goals someday might be with their voice versus if Absolutely. they come to me in a private context and they say I need help belting um well then we'll talk about that and we'll talk about some of the p possible risks and other things and here's what you want to you know so I just think it's different I think the the choral context versus the private voice context is different thoughts Absolutely um well, uh, in addition to private voice, I also taught class voice. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, as a choir director, one does feel um, uh, obligated to do some vocal training in there. I have pretty much given up on all those standard da 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 bum, bum, da 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 I never do that stuff anymore. Um, these repetitive things, which I don't think really teach anything. I, this might be another edgy article I'm going to have to write. So what do you do instead? Because those warm-ups, I, I, well, first of all, I stopped, I, everybody, every choir wants to warm up. Yeah. Okay. I think it, I think it's a myth, frankly, but, um, so let me take it in two parts. They want to warm up. So I disguise the warm ups in other ways. First of all, I never, I maybe will repeat one warm up from week to week, but that's it. I'll do a different one the third week. And I always, I almost always tie it to the music, um, either in a general way, working on blend, for example, or working on matching vowels or vowel modification, things like that. But I will tailor it to whatever I hear in the rehearsal. Um, so, it sound, so it sounds like you're saying, and I think I, th I think I know what you're saying, and I agree with you in that the, the idea that you have to warm up and work your way up to singing is kind of a myth that you, you the way, and I, actually this is something that I say to my choirs too. My dad was a college baseball coach when I was little, uh, that I kind of grew up on the baseball field. And one of the things I remember him saying to players is that you don't warm up to throw, you throw to warm up. Um, and, <laughs> And, yeah. and as like, cause you know, sometimes you might approach like, oh, I'm just going to toss the ball a few times 
and then yeah. and then I'm going to eventually actually throw the ball. And do, like, do we need to stretch certain muscles? Do we need to remind ourselves how how our body needs to align to make a good throw? Uh, yes, but what that's not really warming up. We're teaching them how to sing during that time. Is that kind of what Absolutely. you're getting at? One hundred percent. Again, you've got it exactly. Um, it sort of reminds me of sw- I'm an avid swimmer, and I like to swim distance. Warming up to me seems silly. I just go in there and start swimming. They always, uh, uh, competitive swimmers, I don't know about Olympic swimmers, but people I know, they always do a cool down too. Mm -hmm. And in a pool, that just seems absurd to me. (laughs) It's just more swimming. (laughs) (laughs) You're just going slower. I don't know what it does. And so I feel the same way about warming up in the rehearsal. Um, And uh, there was something else I was going to do with that. I'll come back to it when I think of it. But uh, I I agree one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I mentioned before I did a lot of professional choral singing. Do you think we did warm-ups when it's costing, you know, $500 an hour? uh, No, $1,000 an hour in a rehearsal Mm -hmm. or recording session even more? You think they're going to spend time warming up? And I assure you that these busy singers, the people in New York especially, um, they're just running, and I'm sure the same is true in London or you know places in Germany. These singers are just running from one gig to another. They're and they're not warming up. They come in, they start singing, and they better sound good because mm-hmm. time is money, and you don't have time to mess around with that. And these are people whose lives depend on their voices, so they're not going to do something that's going to damage their own voice. Um. So there is that. I wanted to get back to belting before we sure. leave that. Yeah. Totally. Because um, I love I love gospel music. It's it's you know, I really speaks to me. It just speaks to my heart and the way people perform gospel music. And it doesn't matter to me what race you are. I think gospel music speaks not only to all Americans. It seems I, you know, uh, what's his name? Raymond Wise. Do you know that name? I do know the name, but I don't, I can't place it here off the top of my head. He is, he's a professor at Indiana university. He's sort of, uh, I don't know what his official title is, but essentially it's, he's professor of, of gospel music. Okay. (laughs) And I saw him work with uh, the Crane Chorus last year, and it, you know, he got out of those singers what, it, to me, is my goal now in conducting, which is to communicate with the audience, not only with your voice, but with your face and your body, and what I mentioned before about how God. Uh, 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 singers who belt can really communicate like that um anyway he knows how to get that from singers and gospel music you know there involves a lot of belting in that but i'm no expert in that either but it seems to me there are times when you don't want to belt and when you do want to float a high note yeah of course so so those singers have to be able to do that as well not just the one thing. Otherwise, they're going to really, that choir is going to be limited in what they do. Yeah. They're not going to be able to do everything. Right. And that, yeah, that's a good point. And, and I, I'm going to float an idea at you too and just see what you think, because this is a pet peeve of mine that when we talk about some of these issues, and this might be also a reason why people had such a strong reaction to it online, is that there tends to be a bias within our profession that all of these things we are discussing are simply cultural preferences. That that's really all that's really all they are. There's no such thing as healthy singing or unhealthy singing. I've I've heard academics make that art argument even, and that that has come up on the show. And I pushed back uh, in the first year of the show. Of course, there is unhealthy singing. People damage their voice all the time. That does not. But it isn't as simple as simply saying belting is healthy or belting is unhealthy. There are contexts in which classical singing can be unhealthy as well. I've known of classical singers who ruin their voices due to faulty technique. Um, and mm-hmm. so, so it, it, to me, uh, in the choral context, again, I'm going to be annoying and keep kind of bringing it back to that because I think this is where a lot of the misunderstandings happen. For example, if I'm a female voice trying to sing tenor with a, a bunch of male tenors, 
what am I going to do naturally when I'm in that choir? I'm going to naturally try to blend with those male tenors. And I'm not going to do it on purpose, but I'm going to, I'm going to hear the sound that they're making and I'm going to hear the overtones that they're producing because their, their resonator is larger and their vocal folds on average are longer, which means they are creating a different series of overtones. And I'm going to try to force my voice, again, if I'm that female tenor, I'm going to try to force my voice to make that sound because it will sound better in the context. It'll match better, right? So in the, you use the gospel context. Well, if everyone is singing the same way, it's easier to sing healthily. So in a gospel context, if everyone is approaching it in the same type of registration way, then I don't have to force my voice to do something different. Um, thoughts about that? Well, uh, you're, what you're, I think maybe the word that would summarize what you're saying is blend, because you aren't going to get a great blend if you have a lot of altos singing tenor. As you said, it's two different animals. And you're gonna. It's it's just not going to be as smooth as it might be with other sections. I'm not sure. You know, I don't know what the experience is in the UK where there's so many counter tenors singing alto. I don't know if so many, but they they definitely do it. And I have had counter tenors singing alto, and I just wonder if there's a blend problem there as well because I, it might not be as pronounced. Because in general, the countertenor voice, except for you know the virtuosi and the and the uh, the big stars, it's a softer voice. Yeah. So it, it might just blend in on its own, but um, that's just sort of turning things on its head on, on its head a little bit here. Yeah, and that's a good point. I, I actually have done quite a bit of countertenor work myself in professional choral settings, and I will say that from personal experience, I do. Um, I can do it fairly easily, and it doesn't hurt. However, um, if I'm singing in a, if I'm the only male alto in a section, uh, I do find that it, I fatigue a little bit quicker because mm. it, because I find myself having to to mute certain overtones again or resonances, uh, depending on how nerdy a person listening might be with like you know the the physics of all of it. I find myself having to adjust unnaturally certain vowel sounds so that I can fit in with the sound that the female altos are making. Um, if I was able to, you know, at especially dynamic level, I, I, I kind of have to be louder uh, up there. Uh, so it's an, and it's an interesting thing. And so to me, all of this can also be summarized by uh, being aware of the capabilities of the individual singers within your groups. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a, a soprano, named Deborah Stevens. Uh, she's been on the show before, um, and she has oh. a... Was that the vibrato? Person? No, that was Janae Robison. Uh, this is like this was actually several years ago. It's I think she was on episode fifty something. It was a long time ago, and she is um, a very unique voice. Um, and I've talked to her offline as well quite a bit about the fact that um, her voice is an outlier, and there are outliers of female voice. She can sing baritone, and she can and mm. she can reproduce a baritone sound in a very, very healthy way. And also she has not sacrificed her high G. It's just the way her belt, her, her, her body is built. And I've talked about how, you know, it's amazing that she can do that. Um, it's, but not every woman can. And so to me, this is, again, it go back, goes back to the responsibility of the, the conductor is it's, it, uh, I think we, we avoid these absolute statements like you made in the 1980s, where we say, there's no reason this should ever happen. And, and modify that slightly to, well, it kind of depends on our singers. It, like we've got si different situations where different people are capable of different things. And it's my job as the director to learn their capabilities and then ask them to do things that are within their capabilities. Uh, thoughts about yes. that? Yes. Well, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, and I think it's important, very important, as you said, to keep a singer's options open. I had a singer in college uh, at, uh, at Stony Brook. She could sing anything, any style, any dynamic, straight tone, vibrato. She was so flexible. She had a voice teacher who encouraged her flexibility. This is Christine Gerke, and she turned into a Wagnerian soprano, mm. you know, with a major career. Yeah. But her, her teacher wouldn't let her sing that stuff. Not while she was at Stony Brook. That didn't come until later. 
because she wasn't ready for it. Right. You know, physically. Yeah. Just physically. But that's that was the beauty of that um that ability to be so flexible and sing in so many different styles was what's something that we should strive for, I think. Right. Right. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. The um the voices change over time. Uh they are widely varied. Uh, I mean, throughout bi th throughout biology, uh, throughout the animal kingdom, for example, there are. I don't, have you ever heard of the male variability hypothesis? No. Okay. So no. this is a biological concept uh, that within the the males of species of all the species uh, that they the males tend to v to be wide more widely variable, uh, and the 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 females of the species tend to be closer to the median. Uh, on, on like all measurable characteristics, size, um, coloring of skin and, uh, and eyes and pet of fur, depending on the animal, like there's, a, there's, this, there's tons of things uh, related to that. And it's not, um, it, it's the way I think about that for singers is like, well, what if, uh, what if that's the same thing that we deal with as choir directors? For example, we talked about male sopranos and male altos. Those are rare, but they do exist. And I would say they probably exist a little bit more frequently than a kind of like I mentioned a Deborah Stevens who can help very healthily sing in the baritone range. That's pretty darn rare. Like you don't see that very often. Um, and so I, I wonder sometimes too, if we, we, we start to learn these things growing up in our undergraduate trainings and our, you know, our study of the voice, uh, where we, what we tend to learn is like, here is what is typically true about human voices and then we then, and then we fail to go to that next step and say all right so that's what's typically true but I do have a bunch of individuals here in this choir that I still need to learn the particulars about all of their their voices and you your your example of, of Christine Gerke like even learning her voice over the course of how she grows she's having to learn how it changes over time so I just think it's actually in a lot of ways this conversation is um, so important because it uh, we can really limit our singers also when we tell them what they are capable of and not capable of before we've given them a chance to do it. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, that's interesting theory about male variability. I've never heard of that. I'll have to think about that. Yeah. It's, it's, a, do, it's worth a Google search just to look that yeah. up and, and read a little bit about it. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. I'm writing that down now. Um, but one caveat I think is that, something that always has made me jealous as somebody who always struggled with his high notes is the average uh, female three octave range, you know, compared to the male two octave range without having to go into falsetto. Right. I mean, that's a special skill, as you know, uh, from developing your falsetto. My, my falsetto never amounted to anything, you know, it was awful. I just couldn't, couldn't do it. That's interesting. Too bad. Because it could have helped me, yeah. you know, on on those high notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's but, interesting. I'll, I'll share real quick, like, so why I think for me personally that happened is I sang in a, I was fortunate to sing in a, a treble boys choir when I was in elementary school. Uh, even in the Midwestern United States, we had, there was a couple ret, uh, retired uh, elementary school music teachers in the community that started a boys choir for us. And so I was singing mm -hmm. soprano. Uh, from fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, into my voice changing, I was singing regularly enough to start just making adjustments so that I could keep singing soprano, uh, even as my voice my voice changed. Um, and so I think I just learned how to do it by doing it during. And so I didn't get to high school like a lot of boys do and have to discover their falsetto. I had been using it for yeah. you know for for two years, and then that became. And then of course I taught high school choir where two thirds of my students were girls all the time, and I'm having I'm demonstrating and you know, things like that. So it, it just, it, yeah, it's a muscle. It is a, it's a muscular skill that has to be developed. Yeah. That reminds me, uh, in sixth grade, uh, my best friend and I, we, we had a little duo that we used to sing. He played banjo and we used to sing crazy stuff, but the Columbus boy choir, it's now known as the American boy choir. If it even still exists, I don't know. It, it was based in Princeton, New Jersey, where I grew up. They came around and auditioned us in sixth grade, and we both got invited to join the choir, but fortunately, we decided not to because my voice changed big time soon after that. But a good friend of mine in high school 
uh, somebody who I reconnected with recently, uh, Steve Bryant, his father was one of the conductors of the Columbus Boy Choir. Um, he, he sang in that, and he sang through his freshman year in high school and obviously was using falsetto because he is, he's a real strong bass baritone. We just did Vinterize a couple of years ago, which has always been a dream of mine to sing. And then I decided what I really want to do is play this piece. But um, he's he's same age as me, and uh, he's done all the right things. He still sounds great. I don't know how he does it at 74. Yeah. But, uh, well, he was 72 then, I guess. I haven't heard him since. But um, that flexibility that he developed from having, since his father was conducting, and then so he, he learned how to cultivate that falsetto so he could stay there. Mm -hmm. But. He also had this beautiful bass baritone, also. Right. Well, and of course, uh, yeah. That's that's a that's one of those good examples of just how unique every individual uh, singer is. You know, it's not just. So we talked about the variability in the physiology of the voices. There's just such a diversity of how bodies are built, and how uh, how resonators are shaped, and how vocal tracts are shaped. You know, all of that, uh, it's widely variable, and there's no way that we can prepare uh, a vocal pedagogue ahead of time for all of the variations that they're going to encounter in their teaching career. Um, you yes. know, there, there's just no way to do that. And so I, I think that's partly why the philosophy of it matters, uh, the philosophy of approaching each singer as an ind individual, right? So I, I think that you're, you're, uh, all these stories of our own personal experiences and you know are good illustrations of that. Now, one other thing that I, I thought we, it would be good to, to wrap into this conversation is kind of taking it back to the very strong reaction that you got when you posted these articles online. And I think one of the obvious ones is that in our current time, um, just the fact that your article used kind of blatantly gendered language is yes. partly why it got such a reaction. Did you get like, did you notice a bunch of comments related to that? Well, no, I didn't. I No, I never got any comments because it, they never put it up. Oh, I see. It's, well, it, it was, it, I could, I could swear your article never, showed up somewhere because that's where I saw it. it but it might, I think it got put up and then taken down. I think, I think you're right. I think it was up there briefly. It was because that's where I came across you for the first time. Yeah, because I went in and I edited something, um, and then it disappeared. And I thought, you know, it was some kind of quirky Facebook thing. I shouldn't have edited it. It made it disappear. No, nope. okay. no, but I never really got any. I never saw any comment. Maybe you saw them. I never saw any comments. But, um, but before we get into that into the terminology and the gender issues and all that. I, I, there was just one thing I wanted to remember to bring up yeah, before sure. we move to the area. And because you had mentioned quite a while back in this conversation about the, the inherent dangers of thinking you can teach voice in a choir situation, mm -hmm. in a choral rehearsal. Uh, and I was just reminded about breathing. That's another thing. Man, I think, you know, as a singer, hearing conductors talk about breathing and how to breathe just screwed me up major. You know, it's it's really hard to teach something like that in a group situation because mm -hmm. there's so much room for misinterpretation. And, and then I discovered that breathing is a piece of cake. It's like falling off a log. I mean, we're breathing all the time, and we're breathing from our diaphragms all the time. As soon as you start talking about the diaphragms, you're gonna you run the danger of introducing tension all over the place, which is what I had with and what I taught. You know, as a voice teacher, I was just I'd introduce these concepts, and then I'd spend the rest of the time trying to get rid of the tension. So I just wanted to say that first. Oh yeah, you're yeah, you're dead on. That that happens. That's rampant in choral music for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had been out of the conducting game for a while. As I said, I was playing piano chamber music, and then I had this opportunity to conduct this really good choir. And so I was very excited. But two different people. I mentioned this to you in an email. Um, uh, maybe not in exactly these terms, but two different people mentioned to me before I even got to the first rehearsal. Whatever you do, Tim, don't talk about 
men and women. Like, okay, let's have the men sing this, or let's have the women sing that. So I was very good about it, and I only discussed <laughs> sopranos, altos, and tenors, basses was with the terminology that I use, and mm -hmm. I and I understand that, and it it's just like it's sort of like writing skills where you can torture. Okay, you write a sentence and something not right about it, and you like just torture yourself over the use of this verb or making it a, making the noun agree with the verb or, you know, is this really a word? All you got to do is rewrite it yeah. <laughs> and the problem goes away. So just use different words. It's, it's, you're the one that has been in this conversation and using the word women and men. I've, I've kind of trained myself to stay away from that. I talk about altos singing tenors, not women singing tenors, just kind of to avoid that, you know, it's just not as big a deal to me um, anymore. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. And, and I think, so, all right. So I'm not sure if you, you came across this episode. I, I did a, uh, an episode about a year ago, I would say. Yeah. I think right, right about a year ago where I had collected a bunch of survey data from choral directors about issues like this. Um, and one of the things that uh, I presented is that there is a kind of movement within our profession to completely eliminate gendered language. Um, yeah. and, that, and that is a, uh, it, to be blunt, that is a politically active movement within the profession. Um, yeah. And so when I surveyed people, um, I gave I gave them basically three choices. It's not like a perfect scientific survey, but I my my sample size was several hundred, I think about four hundred or so by the time the survey was done of directors. And the choices were eliminate the gendered language completely, like you said, never use terms like men and women. Um, the other one was this is no big deal. Why are we worried about this? Like basically, don't 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 alter your language. Just be yourself. You know that kind of thing. And then the third option, uh, which is the uh, the the position I hold, which is to be sensitive to gendered language and the way that people use it uh, for themselves. Uh, but ultimately, like my position on almost all things choral, like I've hinted at before, is get to know your singers. If your mm. if your singers don't identify with certain language or certain um, gender identifications, then then as conductor, I should alter my verbiage to respect them. Um, but if I happen to know that I'm in a room with a whole bunch of tenors and basses, and I know that they all identify as men, then I, I don't see any any problem with calling them men. In fact, mm -hmm. in fact, as men, oftentimes we identify very strongly with being thought of as a man. And so I, I also want to respect their identity and saying, okay, men, let's let's uh, jump in here and sing this. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I, again, it, it puts that responsibility on the conductor to actually get to know their singers, which in my in my mind we should be doing anyway. Thoughts about that? Well, uh, yes, I, I like your flexibility and not to have hard and fast rules about the way you conduct yourself or your language, but. Um, in this situation with the crane chorus, I saw them once a week, you know, for an hour and 20 minutes, yes. it was a painfully short rehearsal. Yeah. Um, I get and it. There were yeah. 150 of them. And so, and I had to commute two hours to get there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's no way I could get to know them. If I was a regular faculty there, that would be a, a different story. So I just played it safe. Yeah, and, and uh, respectful. Yeah, and I get that. And I think if like uh, so, I agree. I would make the same decision if I'm if I'm standing in front of an honor choir, for example. I'm going to say sopranos and altos, tenors and basses, mm -hmm. treble mm -hmm. voices. Let's let's. Do, I'm going to use that gender neutral because I have no way to know. Like I have no right. way to know if I look over at the sopranos and say, "Okay, ladies," um, and there's somebody in that section who you know is doesn't think of themselves as a lady. That's just not up to me. Like I, I don't get to decide how how you should be, you know, referred to. So I, and I think I just I just see that as different than uh, working with a group of singers that we've had a chance to, you know, foster a sense of belonging. We've had a chance to grow it, it, relationships with students in a school context, you know, those types of things. I, I think there's room for that flexibility. Sure, because we conduct all kinds of different choirs, like mm -hmm. you said. Well, yeah. 
and honor choirs. And uh, you have a professional, a semi-professional choir as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. That you end up. Yep. Um, and then there's community choruses and church choirs, and they're they're all different. They're different people. They're there for different reasons, and so you have to tailor your behavior, I think, to that. Although ladies is, I'm definitely done with ladies. <laughs> ladies. <laughs> Ladies is gone. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get rid of that one. <laughs> well, and so that's interesting. That's interesting because I don't know that I quite would even be that strong with it because I know that like at in my church choir, because I direct a church choir and it's an older generation. Uh, uh, they, yeah, so they like <laughs> that. They like being ladies, um, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so I just think it, 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 we should be, we should be working to be less rigid and less, uh, uh, fixed in our language in general, I think. That's just my opinion. Uh, for example, a lot of people have different definitions of words that they use. Like when I use the word, I mean this, but when you use the same word, you mean something else. And, you know, being flexible enough to say, oh, well, what do you mean by that? Like, you know, and I think that's partly why uh, you mentioned this at the very beginning of the show about this show being con- seen by some as, as edgy or, uh, or controversial is because I'm willing to do that. Like I'm willing to not uh, profess that I know the correct way to say everything, um, yes. and you know, and allowing people to kind of have these explorations where you're allowed here to come and say, you know, here's why I thought this in the 1980s, but this is why my opinion has changed over the course of time. Whereas whoever was mod- moderating that Facebook group uh, would not allow you to have that conversation, um, and so then it comes across as controversial. Yes, and you said quite a while ago, uh, you're talking about some people who believe in the social constructs of music mm-hmm. and what is, what is beautiful. And, you know, I must confess, my son and his wife, both of whom are professional musicians, opened my eyes a lot to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like in language, you know, I'm a, I've been a stickler for grammar all my life. Um, and, but you know, what is grammar? What are words? It's just what people do and what they agree to do. And once a majority starts where, uh, none of us goes to the store, I mean, that's grammatically correct rather than none of us go to the store, but nobody says none of us goes to the store. (laughs) So I've let go of that and I've let go a little bit as to what's beautiful music, you know, and what's worth studying. My son is teaching a graduate course right now. And one of his students, he asked me for help finding an article for one of his students about the music in Minecraft. Mm. I don't know if you know, if you're familiar with Minecraft, you don't, it, you know, it's like, uh, it's like the new version of Zelda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Though the kid, my kids at school play, come in and play it on the piano almost every day. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And my <laughs> grandson, my grandson is totally into Minecraft and has read all the Minecraft novels. And here's my son is doing this course. I mean, he's always kind of mixed things up a lot, uh, where he'll use a lot of pop music. He's a music theory teacher, but he is no stickler for sticking with Beethoven and Stravinsky and Weber and, and Schoenberg. He branches out into these other types of music, and you know it's 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 really eye opening. I don't necessarily like that music, but it's music. And he's got this graduate student class, and they're just in heaven. They're having so much fun with this. Um, it sort of reminds me of um, I only taught one music appreciation class in my life. And I use the White Album as the demonstration for every parameter of music. Everything was taken from the White Album because hmm. it's all in there. Yeah, yeah. Of course, that's none of the idea. students had even they had never even heard of the White Album, let alone know Rocky Raccoon or something like that. So that was fun to yeah. do that kind of thing. Yeah, and it's interesting because when you talk about um, social constructionism as a philosophy, people who who tend to um, be very, 
I don't know, dogmatic about that idea of like, you know, you only like that music because you are from this background or because you're this race, which is my biggest pet peeve, um, uh-huh. uh, you know, uh, and, and you only like that music because it's what you've been exposed to. Like there's not, there is not zero truth to that. In other words, like it, we do get affected by our social context in terms of what we like. Um, like what you grow up around, there's, especially with music, like music, uh, reflects in us like a sense of comfort and home. Um, and so the, our musical tastes are impacted by our, our society and culture. But my position on it is that they aren't, that, that, that isn't the only reason that, that music might have certain effects on people. We can't ignore biology and physics. Those also play into it. Um, and so to me, the, mo- the more coherent worldview on this type of thing is that social construction does affect our, our tastes and our preferences and what we think is healthy and not healthy and all those things. Uh, but we also have to know about the biology of the voice and the physics of sound um, and, you know, those types of things. So I think that plays into, in a lot of ways, summarizes these types of conversations. Um, am, am I crazy or do you, do you smell what I'm cooking there? No, I I do. Uh, And and the flexibility, because I've changed a lot about uh, my feelings. I was a vibrato guy from way back. But then, you know, everybody got on the straight tone bandwagon. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I just heard Voce Sade a couple of weeks ago. (laughs) And, And no, that's not just done in the studio. They really perform like that. Oh, yeah. I've heard them live live too they sound like that in real life yep unbelievable Mm -hmm. straight tone but you know you start using a big vibrato on jasca it's it's just not gonna work but i heard who was it recently i thought of it this morning uh oh oh a choir that i used to sing in once and i guess conducted it once the new york virtuoso singers and it's all professionals and uh, their conductor, Harold Rosenbaum, posted something, an excerpt from a concert. And there's a decent amount of vibrato in this group, which mm-hmm. was never there before. And I've conduct- I have conducted that group um, like six times, I think. Um, and I said, Harold, what's going on? He said, well, I got a new contractor. <laughs> so he's- but here was a here was a vibrato, something, you know, I've kind of gotten away with, away from the whole vibrato thing. And here, this gorgeous sound, uh, you know, which I really liked because blend is very important to me. And of course, if it's straight tone, it's probably maybe a little easier to get a good blend um, because with vibrato, you've got all different speeds. But, but that's a whole different podcast. And you've yeah. already been there. And, uh, you know, Renaissance versus romantic. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, yeah, this is, this is really interesting, uh, Tim. And I I think these are, um, one of the things that I appreciate is, uh, your willingness to come on here and have your work from 40 years ago kind of critiqued in a way that you, you know, you know, you knew you've watched this show, you know, uh, you knew that, uh, I disagreed with certain things, but, but in the spirit of, um, I guess being true academics, we, we come and talk about how our views have changed over the course of time. So I really appreciate you joining me. Uh, as we kind of wrap this up, um, I want to give you a chance to kind of um, like just communicate any, anything about maybe your article or your own views over the course of your career that I didn't let you get across while we were talking. I can't, I really can't think of any uh, That's right okay. now. Um, one thing that I find frustrating in my personal life, I don't know if this is interesting to anybody, but at my age, well, finding conduct guest conducting gigs has always been almost impossible in the choral world. It is compared to the orchestral world where there's a million guest conductors. So it's always been tough, but now I've, I've faced what I think is a little bit of ageism. Um, mm. You know, one of the beauties about conducting is that it's something that you can do for a long while. There have been a lot of great older conductors, and but I think I think it's become increasingly difficult to find something 
uh, to find a good group to conduct, even for a short time. Yeah. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Fulbright specialist, which is a program that pays me at no cost to the institution to go overseas to a college or university or conservatory and conduct guest conduct for two to six weeks for free and teach conducting no cost to the university. I send out, I send out emails to every music school in Australia, New Zealand, um, Canada. I posted something on a big employment music employment page in Paris. Cause I speak French. Um, I think, I wonder if there's any, this guy's too old for this kind of stuff. Well, you know, that's know. interesting. I've, I've got an insight for you and I want, and, and just, this is food for thought since this is a frustration for you. I think in 2024, you're right that there is an ageism that plays into it, but I don't think it's specifically because of age. I think it has to do with, we are currently in a, in an ecosystem of marketing for, for choral music, music education, conducting in general, that if a person doesn't have a large relevant social media presence, they're not going to get mm. hired because, mm. because half of the, the game is getting funding for those guest positions comes from the ability for the organization to tell a story about their thing online. And if you can't tell a story that gets engagement, you're not going to get the gig, um, you know. And so it's a, it's a, I, th I think it's a kind of dark underbelly of our ecosystem that nobody wants to talk about. Um, it, but uh, that also might be a whole other <laughs> podcast for me to, for yeah, me to go into. It's, it's also partly my own choice, you know. I decided I, I was very happy at Stony Brook. Um, I have like two doctoral students at a time. I love that. Yeah. You know, I could really mentor them. We could really share. I could learn from them uh, rather than try to move up the academic ladder and uh, get better known where, you know, you could get more guest conducting gigs, more honor choir gigs, that kind of thing. Yeah. But it's just, you know, when I, I've become, it's made me a better person and a more tolerant person to know that uh, for once as a tall white uh, financially comfortable, educated male that I can experience discrimination <laughs> for 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 once in my life, yeah. <laughs> and it makes me understand and empathize, you know, with people who have to face this, you know, daily. Yeah, <laughs> you know, who haven't been so fortunate as me. Right. So that's a good point. It's a good point. I mean, discrimination can take on lots of shapes and sizes and motivations and reasons for it. Um, you know, th those types of things. And so, yeah. And I, it's, it's, I think there's nothing wrong with you at your age um, still saying to the world, I've still got something to offer here. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I think that I, I understand that frustration. So I'm glad you I'm glad you shared that with us. Uh, well, Tim, uh, this has been awesome. I really appreciate your vulnerability and coming on and joining me today. I enjoyed it very much, too. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all for listening to this episode. As always, the way that we keep Coralosophy moving into the future. We just hit five years and the way we hit five more years and continue to grow and expand the way that this platform can be valuable to you, the listener, and can continue to be valuable to the music education landscape is you being involved. The ways that you can be involved, of course, are entering the Coralosophy promo code at all the websites that allow that. They are amazing partners that have been with us mostly since the beginning. That's sightreadingfactory.com, mymusicfolders.com, that is also endeavorpublishing.com, and graphitepublishing.com. You can also, of course, go over to Ludus and check out their products. You can do the things directly for the show that help, like go to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and chip in three bucks a month. And if you can't do any of those things, I just want you to join the conversation. So head on over to the Coralosophers Facebook page, like, share, leave comments anywhere that you're able to see the content. Those help other people...